Make sure we can see the screen. Awesome. We are live. Great to see you guys. Everybody's coming in. <laughs> Welcome back. All right. Let's get things set up real quick. Yeah. I can't believe it's already December. Can you? Yes. Like, this wow. This year so fast. I know. Our kids are constantly like, hey, how many days till Christmas? <laughs> I don't know about you guys. We just got used to saying 2021. On, on, I know. On, I know. Now it's over. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, welcome back, guys. Great to see some of the same folks again. Um, please share your name and where you're from in the chat box. Uh, my lovely wife Tiana is here today. Hello. Tiana and I work together, as some of you, some of you know. Um, we've worked together since the day we met. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she is our chief creative writer and also the host of From the Ashes series we have coming out in the months ahead. Um, so thanks for being here, sweetheart. Well, I am so glad to be here, actually. I'm really excited. Um, it, it's wonderful to sit next to my husband because I know he's had a few of these Zoom meetings already. And uh, now to be able to be here with all of you, with the wives being here, it, it's just such an honor. I'm really, really excited. Yay, yeah. I get to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, great to see you again. Great to see you, Jeremy. And you brought your lovely wife with you this time. I did. The better half. The better half. That's the way to do it, man. <laughs> Christy, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. It's good to be here. Awesome. Well, last month we heard your husband's powerful testimony, and we are truly honored yeah. to have you join us. And thank you for what you guys do, helping men and women in, uh, through recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you guys missed out on Scott's uh, story, you can check it out. I think it's on our Facebook page yeah, for Soul, Soul Refiner. Refiner. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I also want to remind you guys that um, the chat is open for any comments during uh, our Zoom call. You also have access to the Q&A to privately ask any questions. And Scott and Christy um, will be helping to field the questions as they come in and We'll save those for the end. Mm -hmm. So if we don't get to your questions, there's no need to worry. Immediately following the webinar, um, you'll have a survey that you can fill out and you can submit your questions there and we'll get back to you. Yeah, the survey is really important. I yep. hope you all do that. Um, and so we have couples joining us. This is usually a men's call. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> thank you, ladies, for taking the time to be with us here today. I certainly understand that this is may not be an easy um, meeting for some of you to be sitting here. Um, so thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is so easily overlooked is um, forgetting about who's the real casualty of war. Right, in, in this war, right? Yes. Exactly. And, yeah. and so the church often overlooks the wife, the spouse, and we spend a lot of time focusing on helping the guy and there's resources for men, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. betrayed spouse is, you know, she gets hit by a bus and we say, hey, let's help the guy. And then she's left there kind of struggling on her own. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the focus in, in, in most circles is always on the man. And I'm glad that now there's more and more help for women, but still I kind of feel like we are left behind, you know. Um, yeah, I feel like we're overlooked a lot. Very much overlooked. <laughs> yeah. And I think that um, for the most part, people don't recognize how betrayal impacts the spouse. You know, porn rewires the yeah. brain of the addict, but betrayal rewires the brain of the spouse. And yes. Betrayal trauma is traumatic to the brain. And it's everything from PTSD to flashbacks to nightmares to impaired sleeping, depression, anxiety. Autoimmune disorders, because it also affects your body eventually. Exactly. Weight loss, weight gain, it's terrible. You just Brain can't fog. function. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and think about this, okay? So if you have uh, a sex addict and you have a betrayed spouse and they're sharing a roof, okay? You're having to live together under the same roof. You are a team of two rivals. That's what you are. <laughs> I mean, it, it's so stressful. It's just, and, and and if none of these 
get any help, they don't deal with their healing, that trauma is going to just recur and the marriage is just completely going to fall apart. So that's why I think we're here because we want to emphasize, we want to focus on the importance of healing. As, as important it is for the addict to seek healing, it is just as important for the betrayed spouse to seek her healing. It's so important because if she does not do her part to pursue her healing, if she just waits on her husband to change and heal, then what's going to happen is she's going to pull him down. She is eventually going to be a hindrance to yeah. his, you know, his healing and for the marriage to to heal at all. So wives, it's so important to to take responsibility as well for your part in this journey. But God sees you and God loves you. And this is going to be a wonderful yeah. meeting we have here. And, you know, it really it's unfair. It stinks in many ways that you know, this was his fault. Yeah. He was the problem. He's the one that caused the issue and she's paying the price for it. And so often what we see are women who say, look, that I, I had nothing to do with it. That's his business. He needs to work on himself. When he fixes himself, we'll yeah. be better again. Um, but the truth is he can get healed, but she still has a trauma brain. Exactly. And so she's faced with these new paradigms that she has to overcome of distrust and and PTSD that physically affects the brain. Um, and she's weaponized. She's she, weaponized. She's got her yeah. walls up. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like, you know, getting hit by the bus analogy. If you get hit by a bus, you don't skip recovery. You don't exactly. skip the hospital. You were severely wounded and you've got to do something to, to get through this, to, to start to rewire this traumatic event. Yeah, because you do heal separately, but you also heal together. And, and that's why this whole journey is so tricky, right? It's, it's like a balancing act and you won't get it perfectly right, but you still have to keep at it. Except we got it perfectly right. <laughs> it's hard work, but there's, there's much hope and yeah. you truly can have a happily even after marriage, yes. a happily even after betrayal. Yes. And I tell you what, if there's a couple who can attest to this, it's Lamar and Christina. They're, you guys are really the poster child for when it comes to healing a marriage from betrayal. Yeah. Uh, Christina joined our team here at Soul Refinery and Kingdom Work Studios as the director of discipleship. And <clears throat> these guys are as real as it gets. Absolutely. And we, we actually met on the set when we were filming Warpath, mm -hmm. the follow up yeah. series to the Conquer series. Yeah. And they shared their story and everyone, everyone went from like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like horrified, yes, like, were. oh my gosh, to <laughs> immensely hopeful. Yeah, their story is crazy, but powerful, amazing, all in one, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So first off, um, are you guys still married? Because I heard that Lamar literally stepped on your toes again. Uh, can you tell us about that? <laughs> well, you have to bring that up, didn't you? But you're just going to make me relive that pain over and over again. This is recent, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. We took a family cruise last week. And if anybody has ever had, okay, talk about disclosing personal information in Ingram, especially an infected toenail Ingram, they oh. are so tender and they hurt so much. I worked so hard on protecting my foot. And on the Lido deck, Lamar may have stepped back on my toe. Oh my gosh. And I may have screamed bloody murder just when the music stopped and pushed him off my foot. So everyone's looking at us and this <laughs> looks like an abusive situation. Gosh, Lamar, why would you do that, man? <laughs> it was horrible. You said. I'm not sure which which direction the, the you know the abuse was. <laughs> I don't know what people saw what they didn't see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It was the emotional just abuse that came afterwards. Yeah. And and as a clarifying point, I I don't want to ever discount anybody's pain that's been through any kind of oh. uh, physical, emotional, mm -hmm. financial uh, verbal yeah. abuse uh, from our spouse. So. But I tell you, what I mean, um, whenever we decide to share our story, or before we teach a class together, before we teach Conquer series or Warpath or Stronger Together it never fails. I mean, things like this happen. It's, I swear the target on our back grows. And mm -hmm. we, we have to laugh because at that moment, the pain was real, not just the physical pain, but I took personal offense to it. I had just been triggered a moment before. And, you know, we sat down and talked about it later when the tears stopped and <laughs> 
in the privacy of our own room. And we were just looking at each other going, how are we going to regroup? In 10 days, we're going to be going before 500 people. How are we going to regroup? <laughs> it was just crazy. Yeah. And here we are. Yes. And here you are. And that's Yay. life, right? That's yes. life. Yeah. Too many of us put on shows in churches and mm -hmm. it's great to see you guys. We're a hot mess. <laughs> yeah, so are we, you know, that's life. We're human. <laughs> but I tell you what, we weren't always this open about being broken, you know, and choosing to be broken together. Uh, we spent a lot of our marriage, the greater part of our marriage, pretend normal, just pretending everything is good, pretending that we had our act together and that we were the perfect family, the perfect couple, the perfect, we had mm -hmm. the perfect so much energy into projecting that. Can you go into that? Sure. I want to hear your story. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we, we met, I was a young oh. naval officer uh, learning how to fly uh, the specific helicopter uh, that they entrusted me. And I met this incredible woman. Uh, I was a great Southern Baptist kid, thought that once I got married, all my problems would go away. Uh, one of my glaring problems that I never cho chose to face was pornography. I had been hooked since I was probably about 13, 14 years old. I thought that getting married was going to you know, kind of wipe that slate clean. That's not the way it works. In that selfish brain, I had no capability to love her the way she needed to be loved. Um, and so without me being able to love her, she had a heck of a time respecting me. Uh, she did a lot better job of that than I did of loving her. But eventually, you know, that, that cycle just spun completely you know, out of control. Um, pornography turned into uh, emotional affairs, which turned into physical affairs, um, and you know, we came to a breaking point in the marriage. Uh, I, I had moved out of the, the, the marital home, uh, left her and the kids. Uh, we have four sons. Yeah, it, it's uh, it was crazy that uh, you know the amount of energy that we put into looking happy um, when behind the scenes we were really good at being roommates. We were good friends, uh, but there was no intimacy. Mm. Uh, and when I say no intimacy, I mean, there's our sexual connection wasn't there. Our spiritual connection wasn't there. Um, we were living parallel lives. It was almost like on two opposite sides of the railroad track, but we mm. never came, the, the bars never connected us. So he would go to his end of the corner at night, I'd go to my end. Uh, there was just zero intimacy. And I think, I believe looking back at stem from, you know, just both of us having expectations going into the marriage of what it would look like. And those expect expectations eventually turned into resentment, um, which gave birth to bitterness. Um, instead of talking about it, instead of fighting it out, instead of uh, being open with each other, we just decided it was easier to just let, live parallel lives. And so that's, that's what we did. And so uh, he medicated his way, I medicated my way, but um, we were both unaware of how much this hurt one another. Um, but God didn't let us live in the dark. And I was unaware of Lamar's um, uh, struggles with pornography. Um, I found out about it once when Joshua, um, our oldest son was very young mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to handle it. I felt extremely betrayed when I found out he was looking at pornography. Um, I didn't want to ask anyone. I was embarrassed. I felt like I wasn't a good enough wife. Uh, mm -hmm. I became super self-conscious. My self-esteem just plummeted. Uh, I felt hideous. I was postpartum. So it just made me feel even more hideous than I already did. And instead of taking the journey with him, I pretty much gave him an ultimatum. And I said, you get rid of this and you, you either pick your porn or you pick your son and myself. And that's it. And then we never talked about it again. I just threw an ultimatum and just brushed it under the rug and hoped it went away. Because that's what we did. We just had, it didn't fit with the perfect marriage and the perfect family uh, that we had created, what spent so hard to create. And it just disappeared after that, right, Lamar? No. I, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> I, I, wish I, could say that. I wish I could say that, but I, I can't tell you. Uh, I'd love to know the percentage of men and everybody can weigh in here on the chat, but uh, how many folks have said they'd never do it again or mm -hmm. try to do it by themselves? Uh, who lied to you more than you? <laughs> and did you lie to anybody else more than you? Mm -hmm. um, and so, no, it didn't work. It didn't work me trying to figure it out by myself. Um, I'm not even sure that it, it would even have worked had we just tried to figure it out, the two of us. Uh, 
this is team ball and not having somebody to help guide the way uh, yeah, exactly. was devastating, both yeah. for us as a couple, for me as an individual, uh, f- with my personal walk with Christ and for my lovely wife and, and really to be a parent. So um, I'm, I'm so excited for, you know, the other end of this, hmm. as we tell these sto- the story over and over again to, to individuals we recognize that it's so little about what happened with us and it's so much more about what he did um, on the other side. Yeah. Um, um, I mentioned earlier that I had moved out of the house. Uh, I was carrying on um, with, with other women at this point. Uh, one of my affair partners was estranged from her husband. And as, as Christ would have it, uh, my exposure was uh, he attempted uh, murder on my life. And he actually did wind up killing his wife uh, and another innocent woman. And so one would think that'd be kind of a rock bottom moment. Right. (laughs) That just wasn't the case for me yet. Um, We were separated. I was uh, living out of our our family's camper. Uh, I decided I was not going to move back in the house. She was the, the very picture of grace and mercy and forgiveness, even though she had no idea the depths of what I had done. Um, She thought it was an isolated event. But she knew that there was, she, she obviously knew of the affair by this point because now it's in the news and right. two people have been murdered. Yeah, it was extremely public. Uh, I downplayed it every step of the way, the classic addict behavior of minimization, uh, making sure that I was only essentially copying to what she could, could verify. Uh, there was no way I was ever going to tell her everything. And mm. so from the very get-go, uh, the, the first disclosure it turned into me trying to manage those consequences all the way. Mm-hmm. First, it was just, oh, she was a friend. I was helping her clean up. Um, and it, it just continued to spiral. Um, I did not I know, come home. Go I ahead. know you guys are so used to telling this story. that it, It's almost, it's just so natural, but it is shocking. It is so shocking because this made the news. Two murders came yeah. out of this affair. I mean, and the, the, the guy, the strange husband, he was trying to kill you as well. Right? Yeah. 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 When, I, when, I, when I exited, you know, mm. the, um, the home where this all occurred, uh, it was at a very high rate of speed when I left. I was on foot. <laughs> and I'm literally running for my life. And I, mm-hmm. you know, from behind, I hear, where is he? Where is he? And so I, I never considered that he would you know, take the life of, of, of his uh, strange wife and her best friend uh, there was another survivor in it um, it's a, that, that's a, a whole different you know mission yeah. and, and i'd love to get through that with some of the men um, just so they can understand that you know god will bring you to your knees mm-hmm. to heal you yeah and that's his mercy and his grace poured out on us um, left to ourselves that's where you wind up in the second half of romans one he goes through very painstakingly through Paul saying, this is what happens if you continue down your path without me shining a light on what ha- what's happening in your life. Exactly. And yeah. It's yeah. an incredibly painful event. And, and, and I'm certain that, that there may be some folks that are, are wondering, you know, what about the, the, the fallout behind me and, and the wreckage in the wake? And um, but it's too important, I believe, uh, that we just highlight what God did and, and in the backdrop of all this. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. I'm yeah. also intrigued to know what Christina was feeling and experiencing at the moment because you were going through your own story mm. at Absolutely. the same time. Absolutely. God was definitely working on both of us and waking us up on both of us. He, he's yeah. so good that way. He doesn't just waste a storm or use it just on one person. Uh, yeah. At this time, uh, when the shooting happened, uh, we were separated. He wasn't coming back home. I didn't know what was going on. I kept asking him, you know, why are you staying in the camper? Why aren't you coming home? Uh, he had just disappeared uh, mm. out of the blue. And it was not like him. Uh, even though we had a marriage that lacked intimacy, he was still a very good father and a very good husband. Uh, so for him to disappear like that and all of a sudden just not be coming home, it scared me. And, mm. and But <laughs> I didn't look for help. I tried to do it myself initially. And so I lost a lot of weight because I couldn't eat uh, and I got very sick and I ended up in the hospital because I lost so much weight so quickly. 
that eventually, you know, my doctor had to have a heart to heart with me and say, you are going to need to do intensive rehab and you're going to need some help. And he wanted to do inpatient. I negotiated outpatient so I could still see my boys. And I called up some just dear friends of mine that dropped everything and came to help me with my boys during that uh, time of rehab. Uh, they got on planes and just <clears throat> showed up at, the, at my doorstep and took over my home because I couldn't run my home. I was absolutely useless. I was a shell of a person. Mm. And the most humbling thing in the world to call up my sisters and say, I don't have my act together. I, my marriage is falling apart. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. And I'm very sick. And they heard me. And without question, they showed up at the doorstep to help out. So God was just so sweet with me to have a sister at the home when the shooting happened, because the first call I got was from Lamar, right? And after the shooting, he said, there's, there's been an incident. I'm alive, but I need to come, you know, get another vehicle and some stuff. And I was completely confused. And then the next call I get was from his boss and his boss saying, where's Lamar? And at that point in time, he told me, you need to know something. Lamar um, has been having an affair uh, with someone from work and it's been brought to my attention. She's just been murdered. And if I had been there by myself, I don't know what I would have done. I was already not eating. I was already taking medication for depression. I was just a mess. But my girlfriend got me in the car. Um, oh, and then the third phone call. Oh, by the way, um, the shooter is at large and he could be coming after you and the kids. So oh, wow. <laughs> Right. So I called up an, you know, another, actually my friend that was with me called up another friend who lives across town. She opened up her door and let us come stay with her um, as all this unfolded um, until they caught uh, the shooter later that night um, and arrested him. So. That's incredible. I mean, I'm sure now that you're sitting next to each other and, and you're doing well, if you go back in retrospect, it's like, it's unbelievable how that happened and now you're together and you're doing such great things for God. Okay. Like, I, wow. I would be the first to say, Tiana, that I was always the wife that said, I will love you no matter what, unless you cheat on me. Yeah. There's, there's always that, that extra piece to my so-called unconditional love. It's, I will mm -hmm. love you as long as you remain faithful. And I'd said that since day one. So it was more of a contract love than yeah. unconditional love. And so our feet were held to the fire and, and uh, God truly uh, was testing me uh, at that, at this juncture as to, uh, okay, what does it look like now? Yeah, exactly. But Lamar, after this had happened, you know, we can talk frankly, we're, we're friends, right? <laughs> This wasn't the rock bottom for you. No. Right. I mean, you, there was, there was much more after this. Yeah. Sad, sadly, I, I, I did not figure it out. This was in August, 2015. Um, the year before that in August, 2014, Christ tried to get my attention the first time uh, I was riding a bicycle down in Captiva Island and was hit by a, a, a box truck who was delivering groceries. Oh my goodness. Wow. And, and almost passed away then. Wow. It, it did not sway me off this path, uh, nor did this event. Um, when I moved into an apartment closer to Christina and the boys uh, at the behest of a lawyer who said that I had no snowball's chance at all with custody if I maintained a camp or residence, mm -hmm. I, I continued um, in my sexual sin, sexual stronghold. Um, I started more affairs. It's nothing that I'm proud of whatsoever. It's just, it's just the way that, that God had this path laid out. Um, I am so, so, I guess, regretful for, for my actions. Um, the people that I hurt along the way, um, we, we try to make amends. We're safe, but uh, the rock bottom occurs uh, at the end of a, a couple bottles of wine one night uh, in November, 2015, about three months after the shooting. And I'm there by myself. Um, I'm doing whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever. Um, not eating, you know, medicating all, all the way around, alcohol, you know, sexual sin, sexual stronghold. And, you know, Christ just says, what, what are you doing? 
what are you mm-hmm. doing? And she's just being the very picture of kindness through this. Um, she had got some incredibly sage advice that um, what do you have to lose? Your marriage is already crumbling. What if you just be kind? And she was just being the picture of grace all the way through. Oh. Wow. And hmm. her response to what God did for her demanded my response to the gospel. And as I went through, we, we were actually going to church together by this point. You know, don't get me wrong. The boys are on one side or I'm on one side of the boys and she's on the other side. Um, there's no way that I felt that I could ever sit next to her again, hmm. much less, you know, have a relationship with her. And uh, it was Thanksgiving, 2015. And I was gallivanting about, I just had lunch with my parents and I was out on some of my, my worldly adventures. And I, I was compelled to call her and um, ask if there was any way I could see her and the boys that day. She was over at her sister's house. And she said, yes, she didn't even ask her sister. So you can imagine the strain that was already on that relationship, hmm. uh, not just between myself and her family, but between her and her family. Yeah. I went over, her father was the picture of grace. Her mother mildly tolerated my existence. <laughs> it's huge if you had known my mom. <laughs> yeah. And a couple of weeks later, I, I stopped in on my way to work. Um, and I said, do you really think you can forgive me for everything I've done? And she said, I already have. I don't even know everything you did. <laughs> of course, in my attic brain at that, at that point, I was still really tied up with a, a whole bunch of stuff I had no business doing. I thought that was license. I thought that was great. I could take almost <laughs> all this to the grave. I did. I mean, I, I thought, sweet, she's, I, I was ready to use that forgiveness, you know, for my own marriage. And so we, I came back home. Uh, we, we had spent Christmas together. We even went on a cruise in January uh, after that Christmas. Um, but God had a funny way of, of as I'm white knuckling and I, I had forsaken all physical affairs. I still maintain emotional ties with some of the women. I was still strung out on porn. Uh, we were trying to white knuckle our marital recovery while I had zero personal recovery. Um, and God just kept disclosing stuff to my wife. And finally, mm. you know, her, her grace was really starting to wear thin. Uh, we were on a family cruise in June. Some more stuff came out. She looked at me and said, we need to get some, some couples help. And I'm talking good, hard hitting Bible based couples help through this because doing it ourselves is not working. I mean, we were reading books together. We were, had been through a couple of uh, godly Bible studies for couples, but um, so we get hooked up with a group down in South Jacksonville. And the first night we go to this couples group, the men's portion where we meet separately, um, they showed the Conquer series, episode one. Yay! <laughs> and so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this. And I'm thinking, you have got to be kidding me. Could this guy possibly be talking to anybody more appropriately than me? And I thought, these other guys have no idea what, what's going on here. And then they stopped the video. We had about 20 minutes of men's time before the ladies came into the room. And the guy looks at me, the leader of the group, and he says, we know about you. Clearly, I've been in the news. And, I mean, I the, <laughs> they have been pre-briefed. And he said, you don't have to say anything tonight. I just want you to sit oh, here. I'm going to go through about a minute long and just kind of give their little synopsis of a story. Mm. And there's a gentleman in there that has sold his body to men and women on Craigslist. There's another gentleman in the room that had spent you know, 21 months in the Florida State Penitentiary for soliciting a minor online. I mean, it's story after story. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, why am I taking such glee and almost luxury in I'm not alone right now? And then again, that's a different topic for a different mission brief, but um, I thought these are my people. And he gets to me and for the first time in my life, I finally told somebody everything. Nobody knew me fully, mm-hmm. nobody. Uh, there was always that secret piece of me. I was never an integrated man. And that was the first step in, in getting in that direction. And that's where we really turned it around as a couple. Of course, she comes in the room. I'm feeling this lightness from finally getting a little bit of freedom. And she has got the weight of the world because she has had the sisters around her now saying, this is really going to hurt and get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. And it's something that that we're prepared to talk about at any time with anybody about how sometimes the man can outrun the, 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 the hurt lady in recovery. And, uh, 
So that, that's kind of a, in a nutshell piece. So. Well, Christine, Christine, I want to figure out like, what were you doing during this time? But first I want to ask Lamar, what would, I know you said that you had a moment with the Lord when you were in an apartment, you were chugging wine. Can you go back to that and tell me, cause it just seems like it was, I know it was significant, but it seems in, in the grand scheme of things insignificant. It wasn't like, you know, the, the tragedy that happened before this, it was just a, an event. Yeah. I think what happens to us, or at least what happened to me is that once I got the freedom that I thought was actually free, you know, being able to do whatever I wanted to do, I recognized that there was never going to be an end to it. I would always try and get up to the latest line I had drawn for myself, see how close I could get to it. And then once I did cross it, then it'd be like, okay, how do I lie my way through crossing that line? And then eventually you get so far past it that you say, okay, where's the next line I'm going to draw? Yeah. And there is no telling what I would have done eventually. Mm. There, there would not have been any limits to where the enemy could have taken um, what was happening with me. Yeah. So it was really a moment of realization of the depravity that the, the, this endless road that you had gone down that you realized, hey, I can't go down this road anymore if my life is going to become normal. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. I, mean, it, I always tell I always tell other men, you know, as they say, wow, it's quite the story, I think. No, no, it's way worse than you imagine. <laughs> you, mine, yours, it, it's, it's way worse than you ever could have imagined. And the yeah. reason to say that is because it really magnifies just how glorious our God is. Yes. And when things happen that just seem completely devastating, um, it is for our good and it guaranteed will be for his glory. Now, whether or not we get a chance to see some of those fruits, uh, I'm not nearly naive enough to think that everybody winds up with a rosy ending. That's not, that's not the way it goes. It takes two people to recover as a couple. It does. But yeah, that's the key. it is available for the individual. That healing is available for anybody. And for you know, if there's if there are men out there that are that feel like they're trudging along, but their wives are completely unwilling to come along with them on this journey, it's it's not for that purpose. It's not you don't do this just so she responds to what you're trying to recover from. You do it out of obedience to what Christ did for you. Exactly. You let, you let Christ work on your significant other. Yep. Yeah. For me, I I think your journey is fantastic. For one thing, you had that desire to to want to change your life do the work. okay to do to do the yeah. work exactly because there are some men i mean they may um not have been involved in an affair that resulted in a murder like yours but you know um but but they're, they're not really willing to change they're just not doing the work to change and and the wives are staying in that relationship hoping against all hope that that relationship is eventually going to change that's not what happened here. What happened here is that you made that decision to change and you went through with it. And I'm sure, Christina, that you weren't just this, you know, doormat. It was like, hey, I'm going to wait forever until he changes, you know. Yeah. And at the same time, Lamar was feeling this external pain of a crumbling family, a, cr a yes. crumbling world that it kind of put the fire under your seat to make some changes. Yes. Although you did have a very high pain tolerance, I should say, <laughs> you know. <laughs> tell you what um team it's everybody's journey is different it yeah. really is and the world is going to tell you a lot i mean you're going to get information from the internet and from good intended friends and from um shows and movies and facebook you name it you're going to get bombarded when you're in this storm of people that mean well telling you what to do and if the one thing God will speak to you. God will tell you what you're supposed to do in your journey because everybody's journey is different. Um, people ask why why did I stay when Lamar was checked out? I had many people say you, you know, tigers don't change their stripes and once a cheat always a cheat. I heard all of these messages, uh, yet God what didn't tell me to leave. Uh, I had to listen to God's voice and. I clearly prayed that uh, that if I were to stay in this marriage and fight for it, that God would make it, would remove the love off of my heart when it was time for me to go. 
so it would be easier for me to walk away. I remember praying that, just I will stay and fight as long as I'm supposed to. But when it's time to go, take that love off my heart so I have the courage to leave uh, and leave my boys and to walk away from the sin. Mm. And so uh, that was a prayer. I prayed all the time, you know, just how long am I supposed to stay when he was checked out of the marriage? Uh, but God was very clear that I was supposed to, to you know, be this picture of grace to him and to not give up. Um, I do remember my turning point, um, the... I think it's one of the biggest moments in my entire life was the first night that the boys had to sleep away from me mm -hmm. and from our home. And Lamar had set up an apartment. Uh, he was in a very dark place. He had no intention of moving home. Uh, at the time, I didn't know there was other affair partners. I only knew of the one who had been killed. And I just didn't get it. And the affair partner's gone. Why isn't he coming home? Why isn't he choosing us? Why is he still pursuing divorce? It just didn't make sense to me. And why is God telling me to still fight for my marriage? And I remember I, I couldn't sleep. It was horrible. I mean, I, I had never spent a night away from my kids um, without at least being with Lamar. And I got a picture of what my new future was going to look like. And it destroyed me. I'm like, we're going to have a place where the kids are bounced between homes. And this isn't what I envisioned. This isn't what we dreamt about and talked about for a future. But here we are. And I remember just not being able to sleep. And I so clearly remember that morning just having a cup of tea and sitting. I was just numb from crying all night long and just sitting on the floor of the kitchen and just watching the sunrise from our back porch. Mm. And this peace came over me. And it wasn't an audible voice, but it was definitely a message I believe was straight from God that I had to let go, that he wasn't mine. I couldn't fix him. I couldn't make him come home no matter how kind I was, but I had to let go and that God was putting me in a place where I needed to make a decision. Did I love him because of the things he had done for me in my life? Um, or did I love him for who he was? And, uh, and I had to just trust that he was enough for me. And that was the hardest lesson in the world because up until that point, Lamar had filled that place. Whenever I had a problem, he was there to fix it. Whenever I had a high, I went to him with my highs. If I had a low, I went to him with my lows. I didn't go to God first. And, and I can see that now. I had made Lamar my mini God. And so God literally removed Lamar from even loving me. He didn't even want to be with me. So I could see that I needed the only thing that could fill that hole in my heart. It's not my kids. It's not my husband. It's our Lord and Savior. And for the first time, I truly believed that I surrendered my life to Christ at that moment. I had never fully surrendered. I believed that it was all real, but I never needed to believe in it because I had always had a safety net between uh, you know, incredible parents, um, sisters, yeah. um, sweet friends. I, I, I always had someone to help me. And I finally was at a point that they couldn't help me. And the only one that could was God. Um. That's the thing, thing about this tragedy, you know, this betrayal is that it will wilt you down to nothing. So all you have is Christ. Yeah. And the key is you've got to abide in Christ. If you don't abide in Christ, you're going to seek wisdom and knowledge and answers from everything else. And, and you look within your, yourself, but you'll find nothing because the answers aren't in here or out there. It's only in Christ. And when we do abide in Christ and he will give us very specific instructions and directions on what to do you know, on what to do with this journey, because we don't have the answers, not necessarily, you know. We don't, Kiana, and that is so true. And I think a message that gets lost along the way is because I did choose to forgive Lamar and I did choose to stay in the marriage. Um, I chose to um, forgive because scripture is very clear that um, if we want to be forgiven, we have to forgive others. It's very clear. It's very clear. You can't tap dance around that. But that forgiveness doesn't mean reconciliation. That forgiveness is a peace between me and God. Um, it's to set myself free. The reconciliation piece is, is a very different story. Some people aren't safe to reconcile with. Some people aren't safe to stay in a marriage with. And God will tell them clearly it's time to go. Because yeah. otherwise you're rolling out the red carpet to Satan um, to have a heyday with you and your family. You'll get sicker. Your kids will feel it. Um, the spiritual attacks will get real because 
you, you're almost enabling and allowing the behavior by turning a blind eye to it if you know that that sin is there. So, um, and Christina, how do you know when you're at that place, when you're at that point? What does that look like? I'm so glad you asked that because um, this, this is something that it's very easy to listen to the world and for mm -hmm. people to tell you it's time to go. But I clearly believe, Jeremy, that God will speak to you. Um, mm -hmm. And God will let you know. Um, you just need to be still and to listen to him. And it could be one day he tells you to go. It may be the next day he tells you to turn around and, and go back. God works and his ways are so much better than our ways. It's yeah. just a matter. I just truly believe that even if you don't listen to him, you take the step and it's in the wrong direct direction. He's that sweet shepherd. He's going to guide you back. Yeah. You, can, you can't do anything that he can't autocorrect or fix. Uh, so it's just really spending time in the Lord, spending time in scripture and, and finding the answer in him as opposed to, um, you know, our best friends or our well-intended family members. Um, I yeah, believe God will speak to us individually. That's right. And, and scripture tells us to seek after wise counsel, but make sure the counsel is wise. Yes. That's Good. the key. The key yes. word is yes. wise. Yes. And we trust our friends, we trust our family, but they don't always have um, the wisest advice. And so we <laughs> have to be very cautious on that. Yes. And another thing I wanted to add to this is do not make a decision based on emotions. You cannot. Yeah. If you are very angry, afraid, sad, you just hit, you can't make a long term decision when you're emotionally unstable. This is why you have to get to a place where you can think clearly you have your sanity back you know you're, you're safe mm -hmm. all these things have to be in place and you you can hear from god you've gotten counsel and you've got a plan in place if 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 the situation does call for you to walk away mm -hmm. you know it, it's not just something you do at a whim everything yeah. is prayed about planned for talked through it's not something you do quickly and it's also something and we get excited about this i apologize but Tian, it's also something you're not called to do alone I tried forever to do it myself because of my pride. I didn't want to admit to anyone or confess that I had a very broken marriage. I didn't want to confess my anger. And, and I tried to do it myself. And it wasn't until I finally you know, made that first phone call to a sweet sister of mine that God had planted in my life where she was speaking God's truth to me when I was in a place of brokenness and just listening to my own anger and my own hurt. And I was thinking, okay, I, I was vengeful. I was, I was bitter. And she could call me out on that. She was willing to say, no, 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 you're not. That is not your identity. That's not who God wants you to be. And she was able to hold my hand through the whole journey. So I do encourage people to find that safe person that's going to point you to God, point yes. you to the cross and point you to the truth. Absolutely. That, that's true. We, we just can't do this alone. And I think most of us have, and that's why we found ourselves in this situation, right? Um, I do want to put a disclaimer on this as well, because, you know, this whole thing about when do you walk away? When do you stay? I mean, no one really has an answer to that. Yeah. That's a really hard thing to say. You, you know, everyone's situation is different. However, if your life is threatened, if your kids are threatened, if it's a life and death situation, call yeah. the cops, you know. Yeah. And that's a no brainer. Yes, exactly. Hopefully. Um, but then you also have a situation where he just never stops. Yeah, exactly. And he shows absolutely no signs of recovery, mm -hmm. no desire to get better. better. Mm -hmm. In some situations, and I've heard this where the guy said, look, that's me. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to change me. And you got to look at that and say, well, wait a minute. God didn't cause her to be a punching bag. She's not to be abused. Exactly. And that's where we have, she has biblical grounds to exit the marriage at that point. But there's not a one size fits all for this. And you got to be careful that you're not looking for that because mm -hmm. it can put you in a, you know, in a hole. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to add something here real quick. I've got a dear brother of mine and I, and I can't wait to go back through these archives on the chat and see if he's joined. I work with him right now little company out of Texas called a fair recovery. And he, he subscribes to the three C's in recovery and he calls it Christ community and counseling. And the community is just being around other folks that are going through some of the same yuck, some of the same stuff or have been through it, or maybe they're, maybe you're shepherding somebody, maybe you're discipling somebody, but that community piece is incredibly important. 
the counseling piece is important as well. Some people are going to require some professional help here. You know, the suggestion I would have would be that, that it was a counselor that has firsthand experience with this. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. really easy for some counselors to fake their way through recovery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. therapy. Yeah. If they haven't been through it. It's very difficult. It's almost impossible. And they yep. can definitely lead you astray. And on the Christ piece, I want to be really clear on this one. We're very inclined to invoke scripture as believers. We're very inclined to believe what we want to believe that maybe God is saying. And as we look at things like fruit of the spirit from Galatians, as we look at some things like first Corinthians, what love is, if any of that stuff has me or self or I tied up in it, then somebody's misusing it. Mm. So as we, as we see what it is that we should be looking at from someone who's trying to recover, mm -hmm. If there's any kind of, of, of me in there, if there's any kind of lack of humility, if there's continued defensiveness, if there's continued acting out, right, that's someone that is still struggling in recovery. Um, and so as folks take a look at that, and, and men, you know, if you're on this call uh, and you've been affected you know, by sexual sin, sexual stronghold, uh, and you're wondering, am I doing the right things here? If you're doing it, any of it for yourself, that's a, that's a keen indicator. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, the, all, the other thing is recovery is not just, hey, I'm sexually pure. I have sexual integrity. We're done. This marriage is great now. Yeah. It's not that. That's just the beginning. You know, guys have to go back and help heal their wives who they run over with their, yeah. you know, their truck. And this is them. the most delicate <clears throat> scenario that you could imagine. You, oh, yeah. In, you've got this union between husband and wife where she has trusted him with such a degree, um, she's willing to be intimate with him emotionally, physically, in so many different ways. And that is what has been fractured. It's mm -hmm. this deep intimacy and this deep trust has now have, has this massive rift and it's ripped apart and that doesn't come back overnight. And so a lot of times we have to, you know, we talk to, to men who were like, you know, well, She's supposed to forgive me. She's, she's got to get over this. Well, look, you guys have been married for 20 years. And she just found out what you've been doing for 20 years. Like, no, no, you turned her into a weapon. Yep. You caused this. This is your fault, man. Exactly. And so now you have the chance to be the hero, but you don't get to put the cape on overnight. Like, you, this is going to be a long journey before you get there. And she's got to be in this recovery. I, you know, I say these words like recovery, relapse. And I hate all the clinical stuff over it. And we talked <laughs> know, about this before. Um, but it's about this. It's redemption, right? It's right. about getting through something. Amen. And you've got God, God on your side. Jesus is there with you the whole time. <laughs> and he wants to see you through. And, and you, you remember, there's three parties to this. You got the husband who's got to get healed. He's got to go through this thing, man. He, it's going to take years two to five years for him to totally transform and rewire this part of his brain mm -hmm. she's got ptsd an immense trauma that she has to get healed from she has to establish this trust again that takes years to do that mm -hmm. and then finally you have the marriage that's the third party the the marriage has to be healed yeah and so this is i believe one of the biggest issues in the church today that they don't have anything to help people with this. And, you know, these Zoom calls are not so that we can come in here and promote Conquer Series and the, From the Ashes. This is to promote that Jesus heals. Amen. He's with us. And without Jesus, you don't have stories like Christina and Amen. Lamar. Amen. <laughs> so thank you guys for sharing this. It's incredible. Yeah. Thank you for listening. We appreciate everyone being here. Yeah. <laughs> probably i'm sure there's probably many questions that uh have probably come in scott and christy is is there anything that might not be too hard for you to ask us well <laughs> just kidding so, so there's, one, there's one that kind of leading along the lines that jeremy was just talking about is how do you encourage others to step up and ask for help in in the church environment that was from howard i think it's a great question how do you encourage others who are afraid or afraid to talk about it you want to talk about the men? 
Yeah, I'd I love to, to talk about this. Uh, really, it's it's almost that first step, and it's, it's almost impossible for men to take based off of what the world's been telling us now for decades, that you have to internalize it, you carry all the weight, you can't show any weakness. Mm -hmm. I will submit that you tell one brother at church everything about you. You find that man that, that you can trust, that you can tell everything. And uh, a, a technique to use here would be, listen, I may not be speaking to you in your situation, but I can almost guarantee that you know somebody you know, either in the church or in your acquaintances that would need somebody else to talk to, you know, completely offline, completely off the books. There's no, you know, no worries about losing a job, no worries about losing a marriage. And in, in that if he's just, you know, looking to get the sexual sin, sexual stronghold off of his chest, uh, if they're looking for marital help, but when you open that door to just one individual, you'll find how, I guess how healing it is for you as somebody going through this, because now you're saying, I want to help somebody else discover their journey to help me cement my own. And then also you recognize how easy it is to tell that next man, that next person, that next couple. Um, and you, you start to see the need as you go through recovery, you see others needs a little bit more easily. Yeah. And for so it's good, Lamar leading it in, but it's more of the wives, Christina. So if you're leading the way and you know what's going on, how do you draw other women into the battle too? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, learn from my mistake and don't try to do it alone. Uh, the other mistake I see is people trying to get too or too many people involved, and that they're taking it to everybody, and then they get bombarded with information, bombarded with advice and worldly counsel. Um, prayerfully consider for that discernment. Ask the Holy Spirit for that discernment. Who is my safe person? Who are my safe people to go to. And I strongly encourage that it's someone that's been through the storm before because they have the same wounds that have changed the scars. Um, we have all been wounded here. The only difference um, between the three couples here and maybe some of the couples that are in the audience is that our wounds have now turned to scars. So when we bump each other, when we fight, they don't come gushing open. Our triggers don't set us back days and days and days. Um, and we can look at them as a reminder, it never goes away. It, we can look at it as a reminder for the battle we've been through, uh, but also serve as a purpose to remember that we once had gushing wounds. And so to get someone that can empathize, that's been through the storm so that they can hold the umbrella for you while you process and grieve and, and deal with the anger and, and discern whether or not what forgiveness looks like along the way and deal with the trauma, it's a process. That's right. So Joy is asking, what do you do if a wife tries to tell her husband how she feels about his betrayal and he shuts her down, verbally berates her and tells her to get healing, but he's not taking any responsibility? What do you do in those situations? Punch him, in the face. Punch him right in the mouth. Punch him right in the mouth. <laughs> We get real here, right? I mean, that's what you feel. That's Seriously. Are you kidding me? Right. Yeah, so the folks on staff can edit that last part out. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't, you know. We don't condone violence. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> mild, mild violence. Right, right. <laughs> Jeremy, I know you're a tough guy and everything. <laughs> Thank you. <him. laughs> I respect what you're saying, though, Tian, because there is a lot of anger, especially when you've been hurt and you hear a woman being treated that way. That's, yes. it's, it's a form of abuse. Yeah. Uh, it really is. It really is. It's hurtful. Uh, and it's, um, I, I, again, just to pray for that discernment. This is not a safe person. And if they don't see that they need help, no one can tell you. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, you need to flee. You need to go. You need to go to God. You need to pray. You know, what, what is my role here? When is it time for, am I supposed to stay? Am I supposed to fight? Or am I supposed to um, fight for the marriage? Or is it time for me to go? Um, right. And there are certain cues through through what you know the unfaithful is exhibiting. I mean, are are there change behaviors? What is the consistency behind those new behaviors? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. this whole man theory change? Is this person still living a segmented life? Uh, I submit that you know, too many times as, as unfaithful, we wind up completely disintegrated. You know, <laughs> and that means that we have all these different silos in our life. And and once we finally get some redemption through recovery. God, God is the whole umbrella of your whole life. There's no longer a work you and a parent you and a, a, a married you, the sport, the, the angry softball guy you. That's all one person. And, and that person is the same in front of the kids, in front of the wife, in front of the, the, the co-workers. 
um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling, to be honest. If anybody out there is struggling with it, let, please contact me. Let's talk our way through this. Yeah. I do want to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, I did want to speak to Joy because, um, you know, that, that is, it's a tough situation to be in. You know, I, I found myself in that situation where Lamar was checked out and he didn't want to come home. And, and what do you do with that? And when I went to God, God was very clear that he wanted me to, to fight for a year. Don't sign any papers. Don't do anything unless I had to, but just do everything I could for a year and to focus on my own recovery during that year. Get my eyes off of him right. and exactly. focus on my own healing. Get right vertically before looking to try to get right horizontally. So I committed, I decided, okay, for this year, I'm gonna do everything I can to own my own stuff, to fix my own past wounds, to, to, to process um, and to allow healing from the, the new trauma wounds. Um, and regardless of whether or not he was in the picture. Um, it, you know, it's not just, it doesn't have to be go straight to the divorce court. Um, if it means emotionally separating, if it means going to opposite sides of the house, I mean, there's stages you can take before going straight to divorce. Uh, but again, that God, God will disclose that God will, will give you that discernment. For me, it was fight for a year, do everything you can. Cause I would have needed to do that anyway, before I can enter into another relationship. If I chose to, I would have had to have spent that time. Uh, to get healthy. So I got my eyes off of him and I worked on my own healing. That's such a great right. answer. It, it's so spot on, Christina, because a lot of times when a woman is hurting, she's waiting for her, her husband, her knight in shining armor, to supposed to be, her. to validate her, to, to rescue her. her. Okay. Yeah. But we can't, because that, that just, um, you adopt or you adapt a victim mindset when, when you do that. And that's very, very dangerous. It's so important to be responsible for your own healing. Because at the end of the day, you know, when we meet Christ, he's going to ask us, what did you do with your life? You'll be accountable for the short life that he's mm -hmm. given you. So we have to take care of that. And it's very difficult for the woman to, it's so to, hard. to get to that mindset that she has to take care of herself and not try to fix him. It's so hard. It's a total act of faith. Yes. Because she's doing something that's contrary to what brought her into that covenant relationship to begin with exactly. was, which is, I'm committing myself to you. So mm -hmm. now she's trying to fix him. And here she is as the victim mm -hmm. and is completely um, on her own. Yes. And these women, most of them who I met, they're so altruistic. They're so self-sacrificing. They are yeah. really awesome, wholesome women who will sacrifice everything. And so for them to take care of themselves, that's a paradigm shift. Wait a minute, I gotta put myself first. Yes, you do, because if you don't, everything else is gonna fall apart, including your children. You can't let that happen. And I think when, when you do focus on your healing, you do abide in Christ, you're gonna see your husband and you're gonna, be able to see these cues that Lamar is talking about. Every decision he makes is an answer to your question, is an answer to your prayers, whether he chooses Christ and you or he chooses his sin. So wherever that sword of his is pointing, that's your answer right there. So keep staying on that journey with yeah. Christ and working on yourself, and you'll see whether your husband draws near to God and you or further, I mean, what do you call this, Go, goes further away from goes you. Further away. Yeah. yeah because when a guy's getting healthy, there are very clear signs to that. Yes. It's very obvious. And, yes. you know, there's a transformation that takes place. And so he stops isolating. He opens up. He becomes more intimate, not with his wife, but with his whole family. He's not as easily angered. God deals with that over time. And so she's like, wow, man, I'm starting to see this radical shift, this change that's happening in him. Exactly. Um, but, you know, it's, I hear questions like this from Joy that just break my heart because mm -hmm. you want to grab the guy around the neck and mm -hmm. say, what are you doing, man? Own mm -hmm. up to this. Accept what you've done. And if there's no remorse, no um, lack of empathy at all, um, that's where you've got to go get wise counsel and you need to seek the Lord. And you, you need to find out, hey, I've been in this for a long period of time. And I can't do this much longer because mm -hmm. God doesn't want to see you as an abuse victim. Mm -hmm. He wants you to get healed and he wants your husband to be healed as well. 
Yeah. Um, but he has to make that choice. And so it's a very difficult situation. Um, and I wish there was just a black and white answer to it. But yeah. the, the, the important thing is to focus on your own healing. Mm -hmm. And you can't, and as you do that, you'll learn that, hey, I'm not going to be a doormat. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let you do these things. There's going to be consequences. And so you'll start to put boundaries in your life where now you're not being abused because it's abusive. Mm -hmm. Betrayal is abusive. Absolutely. <laughs> you it might is. not like that term. <laughs> yeah. It's abusive. Mm -hmm. It is. And I was going to get to something. I mean, this is this is why we we're doing what we're doing here at Soul Refiner. We we sit in the dust with these broken people these women, these men whose lives have just fallen apart because of betrayal. I hate yeah. this sin so much. I really do, because sexual sin has really devastated our nation, everything in, in our culture, the fiber, the fabric of it is just, you know, yeah. terrible. And that's why we're here. I, I really feel like this is, our mission is so important because sometimes you can't necessarily find that safe place in churches okay there are lots of pastors out there who tell women hey you know uh, yeah we're siding with your husband you know just stay you in there endure persevere yeah. i mean really are you serious that's not what the bible says you know i we can go on and on about this i mean this this webinar can go on, <laughs> on i'm serious but i have a lot of indignation for how women have been treated and, and I think if you're a man and you've gone through this and you've been sanctified, you can stand with us because you have the heart of Christ and the mind of Christ to say, this is not right. We've got to do something right here. The body of Christ has to come to a point where we pick up our swords and we point against the enemy. And it starts with healing each other, healing our wives, our kids as a man and as a wife. You help heal yourself and you help your husband heal mm -hmm. too. Because when we heal ourselves, we support them, you know, and, and it's, it's beautiful. What's so impactful about your story is that this measure of grace that you showed Christina. Yes. And, you know, if there's one thing that transforms a heart of, of a hardened heart of a man, it's the grace of a wife. Yeah. And, you know, at some point, grace can run out because we're, we're human, right? Um, but the grace that God has for us is it doesn't run out. And he's there in your darkest hour, and he'll pick you up. And so I think, Christina, the grace that you show Lamar is, is, was transformational for him. And uh, it's a huge testimony for, for you guys that can uh, yeah. hopefully make an impact on those who are watching. Thank you. I think that's one of my favorite expressions of all time. I, I truly, and I see it when I get to work with women, that grace wins every time. And I'm not talking about just because you're you end up with a restored marriage or you you know the, the marriage is is redeemed. No, I've seen women that have chosen divorce that are the most beautiful pictures of graces uh, of grace and the freedom they experience, letting go of bitterness, letting go of the right to be anger, letting go of that debt that's been created between the the exes or the husband and wife. It's a beautiful thing. And you when you see a free woman, um, and that's, that, that is my message every time I've, I've talked to a woman, what would Jesus do? What is, what, how can you be graceful in this? Um, and that doesn't mean, like you said, being a doormat or, or being a punching bag. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but that goes for men too. Uh, give your wife room to grieve. Um, like Lamar said, she's just, her world's been turned upside down. If you've just done disclosure, she needs time to process. She needs, a, she needs, um, space to grieve and space to, to get angry. I remember a season where um, I was just angry. And I think a part of me was just testing to see if he was gonna leave when I got angry. Cause I wasn't <laughs> sure he was really committed to staying. I almost feel like I was subconsciously testing him. So he's <laughs> angry and ugly and venomous. And are you really gonna stay now? And he passed the test. <laughs> I still test him every once in a while, you know, just to make sure, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Lamar puts his head down. It's a journey, and we haven't mastered this by any means. And I, I am not graceful all the time. I struggle with this, but I pray for it. I pray for it for my sisters and I pray for it for my brothers. Uh, you know, Celia is asking. 
at what point is relapse a stumble versus a return to old patterns? Yeah. Mm, that's a great question. That's a great question. Really so at what point is a relapse a, just a stumble versus a return to old patterns? And so first thing to recognize is <clears throat> when you're changing the brain, it doesn't just change, right? <laughs> this, is like, this is like climbing Mount Everest times 10. It's the hardest thing to do in the world. Um, so you can't do brain surgery on yourself. You have to get in with other men. And during this process of recovery, men are going to stumble. They're not going to be, you know, perfect. And so, Lamar, how would you, how would you address that? When, when is a stumble? Um, when is it just a stumble? When does it become a return to old patterns? This is a great question. And I, I love kind of looking at this from a lens of little R relapse and big R relapse. That's big it. R relapse, some of those, some of those non-negotiables between a, a, a man and a wife, yeah, be that, is it looking at porn? Is it uh, reaching out to other women? Is it searching old affair partners? Is it a, another physical affair? You know, whatever that looks like, that big R relapse. And it doesn't just happen. A man does not wake up that's in recovery and say, today is the day I'm going to throw this all the way again. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. There is a significant amount of little R relapse before that. Yep. And, and it usually winds up with some selfish notions. You know, I don't deserve to be treated this way. I've paid my dues in recovery. I'm mm -hmm. further along than she is. Um, it, you're starting to get a little glimpse of this. Yep. He's putting his guard down. That's it. Starting I, to I, lie I, to himself. You know, I don't need the community of other men. I yeah. don't need, I, I feel good enough to be healed. Great. If that's the case for you, that's wonderful. Get your butt out in front of some, in front of some other men that need it. Okay? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Good about it. And so, um, yeah. so those little R relapses are what get you to a big R relapse. Um, yep. If yeah. you don't pay attention to the little ones, you are destined. You, I, I love to say, I will capital W-I-L-L -L, go back. I will go back. Mm. Yeah, so one of the, the identifiers to, to recognize if, if this is a return to old patterns is to, to ask him, say, look, you know, where are you at? Mm -hmm. um, you, you've made a mistake. We both acknowledge that. You validated the, the pain that I feel as your spouse. Um, so now what are you going to do going ahead? What does that look like? You know, you may, and some people find this extreme. I don't. I find betrayal extreme. But Ask him to take a polygraph test in six months. Hey, you know, you fractured distrust again. We were, we were making some progress, and now I feel like we're going back to where we started. For my sake, can you take a polygraph in six months? I just want to know that you're going to be on the right path going ahead. And I tell you, if there's anything that's going to hold his, his, him, him to the fire, it's going to be that. It's just the idea that he has to go and get wired up and take a polygraph. Okay, but I have a question for you. So, all right, um, trust can be broken in many, many areas, okay? Sexual integrity is just one of them. Mm -hmm. But there's also this other trust of like, can I trust you with my heart? Can I trust you that you'll be kind to me, that you won't uh, berate me with, you know, verbally or verbally abuse me or right. um, try to manipulate me or gaslight me? You know, can I trust you to, to not do that, you know? So well, that's where there's with, a relapse. With betrayal, you often find that those things are happening before he he relapses. Yeah. So there's a trail behind this. You, you notice, hey, why are you acting strange? You know, why don't you come around? Like, why are you isolating? Why are you so angry all the time? Right. This is all the behaviors leading up to it. And so that's where I would say, you know, you you, you really have to be in a group with other women who are going through it. They've got. Um, a wise leader who's leading this group and you're 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 following what they what they say because often you can't you've got blind spots mm -hmm. and you don't know which direction to go yeah however what what would you say christina to a wife yeah. who's, who's who's experiencing this you know her husband has gone through recovery he's gone a long time and then all of a sudden he relapses and then mm -hmm. she's not sure is this old patterns or is this an oops you know uh I think what should this you is do? A wonderful, wonderful conversation to have. And if I could speak to the men, uh, something that Lamar did for me that he was coached into doing that helped with my recovery 
um, and helped me feel safe again with him was he, he made boundaries. He established safeguards. He put up, um, he set up measures for me. So essentially I listed the things that were triggering, uh, the things that made me nervous. And he took that list and he created safeguards, not only to my list of triggers, but things that trigger him. Uh, I'll give you some examples. For, for example, um, going to restaurants, he used to face the door telling me he was keeping uh, an eye on who came in in case there was a threat. Where in, in all reality, it was looking to see if there was someone in a you know, short skirt coming in the door. Uh, so now when we go to restaurants, he, he faces away. He sits us and is intentional about facing away from the door and looking directly at me. Um, so putting, you know, going to when he would travel, um, disconnecting the television or, you know, he would put these safeguards in place so I didn't have to feel like a babysitter. Because Tiana, you know, and, and Christy, you know, too, there's nothing sexy about being a babysitter to your husband. And when they're going in recovery, you feel like, oh, you got to do this, you got to do this. And, and, and so their, their wrists are free from the shames of their sexual sin just to be replaced by a, you know, a tight leash that the wife holds on to really mm -hmm. close by because she's so scared he's going to act out. When a man, gen I mean, just genuinely gives the woman these boundaries, it frees her from this fear and, and she's able to see the changes in what he's willing to do to make her feel safe. So then when these little R relapses happen, um, it's a slow fade, you know, it's a step like Lamar was saying towards the edge of the cliff. You don't just wake up falling off of the cliff. Mm -hmm. And so when I see that, oh, that's, that's kind of peculiar Lamar that you would go and have a drink with your friend at a bar when that was a safeguard you put in place for me. You know, it's, it's one step. He didn't commit an affair. He didn't meet with a woman, but that was still a boundary he put in place to make me feel safe. So we can start there as opposed yes. to going to, you know, waking up and him saying, yeah, I've, I've had a relapse. There's yes. all these safeguards we put now around us um, to keep us safe. And it's a gift that he can give me. These are all such great story, Lamar. I, but I was just going to say that this is all like amazing advice because I think boundaries is so important. When you kind of like, know that this could potentially happen. Okay, where can I relapse? I can relapse sexually. I can relapse by yelling at you, shaming you in public, doing all these things. I can relapse in those areas. I'm gonna set these boundaries and consequences. And so if I don't commit to my boundaries and if I don't commit to these things, then I'm gonna have this consequence. And, and in the new series that we're creating from the ashes is a great series for the women, by the way, for the betrayed wives It's going to be fantastic, very cinematic, don't but you know, don't pop it up too much. Don't it pop it up too much. <laughs> Christina was there. It'll it was be pretty... <laughs> okay. It'll be okay, guys. It's like, great. <laughs> yeah, but it's going to really help women. We've been praying for this about it and, and working on it like crazy, but um, I'm, I'm excited about that one when it comes out. Yeah. One of the mm -hmm. people were asking about it, you know, when is it going to be released? Mm -hmm. Hopefully in the spring, um, we're going to have something out. Hopefully, We've been working yeah. on this for quite a few years. Lots of obstacles like you and Lamar, yeah. right? You, you have obstacles when, when you tread on, on, on this, you, you do. So <laughs> yeah, we get our production got shut down uh, because of COVID. And then we had an international cast. It's mm. rather big production. Because um, mm -hmm. it was both a feature film and a series that's going to be used in, in groups. Yeah. And so we had an international cast. We were shooting this thing in Holland, or Holland, uh, <laughs> Ireland. Ireland. <laughs> and it just got shut down because COVID hit two months, mm -hmm. three months later. And so we've been trying to piece this thing back together. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's ask a few more questions, maybe one or two. Okay. Alan, um, I'm devastated by the pain and suffering I've caused my wife unnecessarily because of my addiction how can i best help her when she doesn't want my help so scott and christy could you weigh in on that how so this guy he's devastated by the pain that he's caused his wife but she doesn't really want help so how can he help her when she doesn't want help what does it look like uh, the first thing i would say is pray for her um diligently pray for her because only God can change her heart to pursue that healing path. Um, and that is certainly a prayer within line with God's will. 
you know, so, um, you know, his timing, his way. Um, but I think the most important thing that the husband can do is, is pray for his wife. Um, and then, you know, just like it was talked about before grace wins. And if he is, um, persistently, um, sharing grace and kindness, um, and she is seeing some change in him. I don't know, Scott, you had talked about kind of what got you started on your journey. Well, I was watching me. Yeah, I saw your courage and I saw your tenacity. And but I mean, it's in the absence of that. I, I think using the pain that that I've caused, maybe that is an emotional driver, you know, to be drawn closer to Christ. I mean, I allow that <clears throat> that hunger that you have for your your bride to be connected with Christ. And then like Christy said, allow Christ to do it. I mean, we can do, I don't know, men think we can do a lot of things, but God can do immeasurably more than we can even imagine. And so turning it over to, to Christ is the way to go. I think yeah. that's, that was good, Christy. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I also thought of when, when you guys were saying that was that sometimes it may the help might not come from the husband. Yes, he can pray, he can do his part to love his wife unconditionally, no matter if she doesn't want his help. But it's like this, you just shot your wife with a machine gun. And now you're saying, hey, baby, I want to help heal you. I mean, put yourself in her situation. She is like, yeah, you were the no, perpetrator. like, get away from me. You know, that's, yeah. yeah, you're the perpetrator. So maybe what you can do instead is find a support group for her. Find someone who can help her. And you can say, honey, I love you. I might not be the best person to help you, but I know someone who can, because I really, really want you to heal from what I've done. She sees that, oh my gosh, it's going to open her up. Maybe not to you right away, but you know, it's 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 gonna get her started moving in the right direction. Yeah. And normalizing the pain in a in a group, yeah, outside yourself. So yeah, other yes. women. spot on. Yes. Um Christina, what would you say to anyone who struggles through the holiday season? Mm, great question. I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, for men and women, this could be a very, very difficult season. Um, but since this was, I'm assuming this is from a woman since it was directed towards me. It's so easy for us to be reminded and triggered um, and fearful to allow ourselves to be joyful during the holiday season. I remember my first Christmas we were together. I almost felt like if I was joyful, then he's going to see it as a oh, free pass, you know, recovery is good. We're good. We don't have to do anything. She's completely forgiven me because she's happy. That's not the case at all. Um, I, I also feel like uh, Satan does a number on us. Um, he takes so much from us and our vulnerability. Uh, our memories get all mixed up. So we don't like looking at pictures and we look back and think, well, what was he thinking of? And even our wedding band might trigger us. I mean, there's just so much holiday music or going to people's homes, family members, traditions, mm -hmm. it can, everything can be triggering because we're now, the memories we have are now all tainted and we're trying to figure out well, what was real and what wasn't. And, and he takes so I, I believe the enemy takes so much from us where a lot of women just shut down. Me too. I was there and I'm not going to celebrate this anniversary. I'm not going to acknowledge this date. I'm going to rip up pictures. I'm going to, I've been there, but there's sweet, sweet victory when you get to a place and say, you know what, Satan, no more. This is Jesus's birthday. I am going to allow myself to be joyful and enjoy it because he's already taken too much from me. And eventually we need to stand up and just say, you've taken enough. You're not going to take this holiday season too. I choose joy despite my circumstances. That's happiness, by the way. Happiness is based on our circumstances. Joy is something God gives us. Amen. And when we spend time with him, we can feel that holiday joy. And, and just one other thing I want to put out there. This is the season of miracles. I mean, when we think about it, our, our God came down in human form and, and, and a precious baby. I mean, it doesn't get any more miraculous than him coming and walking on earth with us, right? And when we look at the Bible at all the miracles Jesus did for us, there was one common denominator. Mm. It all started with a problem. There was a lame man, there was a blind man, there was a yes. dead man, there was an adulterous woman. There was, it all starts with a problem. Well, guess what? 
let me give you some hope. If you're here, most likely you have a problem. There's either your problem of a sex addiction or problem of being betrayed and the pain that you're going through. Everyone here has problems. So guess what? You are in the perfect seat to receive a miracle this holiday season. Yes. So it starts with a willing heart. It starts with a willing heart to be able to say, uh, your way, God. Your way might not be my way, but in obedience to, to what you're calling me to do, it's your way. And I accept this joy and I'm going to give myself permission to enjoy this holiday season. Yeah, let me let me just clarify something. Men, please don't don't fall in that trap of like demanding oh. that your that your ladies, you know, just buck up and thank you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, so, that uh, is right, Lamar. Incredibly detrimental. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Read, read the tea leaves, men. Yes. Okay. Read the- this might be the holiday she needs to breathe, and maybe the next one too. You you have to give her space and let her do recovery her way. Thank you for saying that. That is very important. Yes. And men, don't step on your wife's toes this holiday <laughs> season. Okay, push off the ship. <laughs> literally, literally, don't step on her. Yeah. And ladies, we have a sisterhood here, by the way. So if, if your guys demand that of you, we've got great ideas on how to get back at him. I'm kidding. <laughs> kind of do, we kind of do, but <laughs> I got to fix my halos a little, you know. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah, but you know what, guys, thank you so much for coming here today. First of all, I, I, I feel so honored that we can come together as a couple and or as couples and and be here and share this space together right it it means so much for a wife to have her husband here by her side saying hey i'm here for you baby i'm I'm gonna fight for you i'm gonna fight for this marriage so every one of you guys who are fighting for your marriage you are heroes you are heroes we need you your family needs you your wife needs you your kids need you this world needs you and for you ladies who are going through this and and this is a painful period uh i just want to tell you one thing God sees you. God sees you. He hears you. You are not alone. You were never meant to go through this journey alone. Okay. And, and here at Soul Refiner, everyone here, we're working so hard. We're working around the clock to, to finish from the ashes, to, to do all these things that we're doing here so that we can bring medicine to you. Medicine that God has given to us that we're not giving to you, which is so wonderful. And we wanna help you walk through your healing. So in the meantime, while these series are being done, we wanna take you under our wings and we just wanna connect with you. Um, So we wanna invite you to our next Zoom meeting, which is gonna be on January the 14th at 11 a.m. It's a women's only meeting. No, it's not. So I'm glad you said something. So this is how it's gonna work out. Okay, guys, you're gonna meet here in this meeting room. We're all gonna join together as couples and then we're gonna break into two groups, the women and then the men on their own, okay? And us gals, gals, we're gonna have a great time together. I said gals, gals, <laughs> we're gonna have a great time together. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of laughing now. You gotta help me out here, baby. <laughs> That's what our oh, seven-year-old daughter she says. Does. She says gals. She says gals. Yes. Um, And um, so I want to talk about the next meeting, by the way, because our uh, keynote speaker is Michelle Portier. And Michelle Portier is fantastic. She has a great ministry. She's been through betrayal. She has a phenomenal story. She's a war veteran as well. And you're going to hear her powerful testimony. Uh, So please feel uh, feel free to share this invitation with your friends and uh, send it to the sisters that you know um, so we can help them through their betrayal and they can benefit from this community. Awesome. So January 14th, that's a Friday. Yes. Um, we're going to meet again and Merry Christmas to you guys. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, Scott, would you mind closing us in prayer? Sure, I'd be honored. Awesome. Lord, as you pull back the curtain of shame and and uh, that separates us from your love, Lord. And, and we allow Emmanuel to shine in, the, the light of your, your word, your truth, and your love to shine into the stories of our lives. Lord, help us to know that as we fight the good fight, that we're pressed on, or we're pressed hard on either side, on all sides, but not crushed. We're, we're frustrated, but not left in despair. Lord, we're persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Lord, you'll never leave us or forsake us. And help us to draw on you and in your power and your love as we fight the good fight together. And I pray this in your most holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah. And before we 
wrap. Okay, we want to invite. Um, yeah, we want to invite you all to just write um, any of your prayer request, and yeah. then you know. Yeah, you, there's a survey that comes up after the end of this. Yeah. And so if you have any other questions or prayer requests, just drop them in that survey. Yes. And um, we pray over that stuff here at, at uh, Soul Refiner. Yes, we do. Yep. <laughs> all right. God awesome. bless you. Love you guys. Love Take you. Care. Bye. Bye.